Welcome everyone. My name is Lexi Thomas and I'll be your moderator today. We are all pleased that you could join us for this week's lecture in our seven week No Neuroanatomy mini series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different neuroanatomy topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would also like to recognize our No Neuroanatomy planning group for their hard work curating volume two of this mini series. We would also like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for the series. And before we start, we want to make everyone aware of our YouTube channels. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available for your viewing pleasure. Please check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures. Here are the disclaimers for this series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Piritinsky for today's lecture titled Ventricular System and Cerebral Spinal Fluid. Dr. Irene Piritinsky is a board certified and licensed clinical neuropsychologist with years of clinical experience. She completed an APA-approved internship at Bedford VA and a two-year clinical neuropsychology fellowship at Butler Hospital and Brown University, where she investigated the role of normal pressure hydrocephalus on cognitive functioning. Dr. Piritinsky has extensive experience in cognitive testing and diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, frontal lobe dysfunction, and psychotic disorders in the elderly. She also specializes in neuropsychological evaluations for children presenting with developmental delays and or possible autism spectrum disorder and chronic medical conditions. Among Dr. Piritinsky's primary clinical interests are geriatric neuropsychology and neurodegenerative disorders, movement disorders, pre and post surgical evaluations, and for deep brain stimulation candidates, and normal pressure hydrocephalus are additional areas of expertise. Dr. Piritinsky supervises practicum students, William James College internship, consortium trainees, and fellowships uh, through a two-year APA-accredited postdoctoral training program. She holds faculty appointment and is affiliated provider with St. Elizabeth Hospital and is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Tufts University School of Medicine. Everyone, please welcome and joining Dr. Piritinsky. Dr. Piritinsky, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Dr. Piritinsky, you're on mute. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, can you see my slides? We can. Thank you for introducing me. Um, welcome. Um, so I would love to start by talking to you about ventricular system and cerebral spinal fluid. Um, I'm gonna try to make this as exciting as possible, um, given that there's it's a bit of a dry, tough, wet topic. Um, and I just want to start by um, thinking um, and pointing out all my mentors that have been with me along the way. I hope everyone who's listening, future neuropsychologists or neuropsychologists have their own mentors. Um, they make it all possible um, and they help us out along the way. Um, I also wouldn't be here today if it wouldn't be for the desire to inspire our future neuropsychologists. So these are just some of the students um, that have received their training in through our program. Um, so to start off, uh, we will talk about gross anatomical features. We'll discuss ventricles and choroid plexus. We'll talk about cerebral aqueduct, um, arachnoid granulations, and then we will touch a little bit on the function of cerebrospinal uh, pressure, cerebrospinal fluid, and production and circulation. To keep things as entertaining as possible, I've included a lot of pictures, but uh, technology is not my strongest suit, so hopefully these pictures will help out a bit. Um, so when it comes to structure of the ventricular system, we have two lateral ventricles. Uh, we have one in each hemisphere. The ventricles of the brain are communicating networks of cavities that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid and located within the brain parenchyma. The ventricular system has two lateral ventricles, one third ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, and the fourth ventricle. 
The ventricle lining consists of specialized epithelial membrane called uh, epidermal layer. Um, when we are talking about lateral ventricles um, and the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, um, the, they extends anteriorly, anteriorly from the body of the lateral ventricle into the frontal lobe. The area of the lateral ventricles anterior to the foramen is the anterior horn. Um, and you can see my slides, but I can't see them very well. Um, the anterior, inferior, and posterior horns of the lateral ventricles um, are located in the frontal, temporal, and occipital lobes, respectively. Uh, the temporal horn um, of the lateral ventricle is surrounded by the hippocampus medially, um, and the perihippocampal white matter inferior, inferiorly, and temporal lobe white matter laterally and superiorly. The occipital horn um, of the lateral ventricle almost completely encompassed by the white matter. The two lateral ventricles are mirror images of one another and they're separated by uh, septal nuclei. Move to the next slide. Here, what I wanted to make sure that we go through is the structures around the lateral ventricles. And as we are, if we imagine ourselves being in the body of a lateral ventricle, there's corpus callosum, hopefully you can see my images and writing here, um, which forms the roof of the lateral ventricles to the fornix. The large gray matter structure bulging inward into the ventricles are forming lateral walls and caudate nucleus. That is the, I'm sorry, that is the caudate nucleus. When getting ready for this presentation, what I try to do is include the information that I used when studying for the boards. And one of the important points to remember is that germinal matrix, which is highly cellular and highly vascularized region of the brain is found below the lining of the lateral ventricle. It's from this region that cells migrate during development most commonly between the 22nd and 30th week of gestation. The germinal matrix diminishes gradually and disappears by about 36 uh, weeks of gestation. Because of its location in the vascular watershed zone, the germinal matrix is the most common location for intraventricular hemorrhage in preterm infants. We should talk a little bit about foramen uh, of Monroe here as the frontal horn begins anterior to the foramen of Monroe or intraventricular foramen. The frontal horn is located in front of intraventricular foramen uh, or foramen, uh, foramen of Monroe. It's a triangular shape um, with boundaries anterior part of trunk of corpus callosum as a roof head of caudate nucleus as a head and septum palisadium as medium wall. The lateral ventricles left and right communicate with the third ventricle below via intraventricular foramen or foramen of Monroe on each side. The frontal horn uh, begins anterior to the foramen of Monroe or intraventricular foramen. Um, and what I hear, um, I would, I wanted to show the stepwise dissection of the atrium of the lateral ventricle. Um, it's kind of beautiful. If you look at the A slide, a superior view of the central core of the right hemisphere, the transverse temporal gyri, the most anterior of which is Herschel gyrus, um, are located. Sorry, there's a question. I'm sorry, I think there's a question, but I can't see. Um, the transverse temporal gyri uh, seems to radiate laterally and forward from the apex um, situated lateral to the atrium. If you look at the B and C slides, um, the insula in the upper part of the temporal lobe have been removed to expose the atrium and temporal horn. Hope you can see the slides clearly. The choroid plexus is attached along the choroidal fissure, uh, which extends from the foramen of Monroe to the inferior 
subcoroidal point located just behind the head of hippocampus. The internal cerebral vein empties from the foramen of Monroe into the vein of Galen in the roof of the third ventricle. If you look at the D picture, uh, the thalamus has been removed here to expose the ambient cistern, which we'll talk in a little bit about. The floor of the atrium is formed by the collateral uh, trigon, which overlies the, coll uh, the collateral sulci. That inferior part, that inferior part of the medial wall of atrium is formed by the prominent that overlays the deep um, end of the calcarine sulcus. The posterior cerebral artery courses through the cruel and ambient cistern of the medial side of the temporal lobe. So as we're covering these lateral ventricles, the next uh, obvious talk would be about the third ventricle. The midline is normally slit-like. I hope you can, again, see my images here. Uh, slit-like third ventricle that's bounded laterally by the thalami. The lateral ventricles communicate with the third ventricle. The CSF cerebrospinal fluid flows from the lateral ventricles via the foramen of Monroe in the third uh, ventricle. And then it reaches into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct of the brainstem. So the third ventricle communicates with the fourth ventricle below via the cerebral aqueduct. The walls of the third ventricles are formed by the thalamus and hypothalamus. Maybe important information to know if you're studying for the boards, amnesia has traditionally been associated with dorsolateral thalamic lesions um, as shown by studies of tumor patients and the walls of the third ventricle um, and of the and usually associated with the Wernicke-Korsakoff disease. So the fourth ventricle here is a diamond shape um, cavity located dorsal to the pons and upper medulla obligata and anterior to the cerebellum. The fourth ventricle is rhomboid in shape. Um, superiorly, it narrows to become continuous with the aqueduct of the midbrain. Inferiorly, it narrows and leads into the central canal of, of the medulla. The fourth ventricle is widened at the point called lateral recess. The CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, flows from the lateral ventricles via the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. Then it reaches into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct in the brainstem. The third ventricle communicates with the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, also known as the aqueduct of Sylvius, which travels through the midbrain. In case you haven't had enough of my visualizations, the roof of the fourth ventricle is formed by the cerebellum and the floor is formed by the pons and medulla. The interior boundary or the floor is formed by the pons superiorly and medulla inferiorly. The posterior boundary or the roof of the fourth ventricle is very thin and is concealed by the cerebellum. So as the third ventricle communicates with the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, it's the fourth ventricle that becomes continuous with the, uh, with the central canal of the medulla and the spinal cord and opens the apertures into the subarachnoid space. The CSF is produced in the choroid plexus of the two lateral ventricles. The CSF functions as a reservoir to get rid of metabolites and toxins from the brain. It also plays a role in hemostatic hormonal signaling, chemical buffering, circulations of nutrients, and neurodevelopment. Bulk uh, flow and diffusion promote water and solute distribution in and out of the brain. The CSF flows from the lateral ventricles in via the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle, and then it reaches the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct in the brainstem. From there, it passes through the central canal of the spinal cord or into the cisterns of subarachnoid space via three small foramina, the central foramen of Magandhi and the two lateral foramina of Luchanka, Luchka. 
Um, again, another maybe important information to know, and we'll talk about hydrocephalus, which in my head kind of comes up when I think about CSF, the fluid, um, the hydrocephalus can occur if these foramen are, are uh, occluded uh, via the meningeal tumor. And then the fluid flows around the superior sagittal sinus to be reabsorbed via the arachnoid villi into the uh, venous system. So the CSF within the spinal cord then flows down to the lumbar cistern to the end of the cord around the cauda um, and bath is the whole of this, uh, bathes the whole um, spinal cord. So the cerebral spinal fluid um, is clear fluid, which is produced by the choroid plexus and circulates around the brain and spinal cord. Um, the, what's really important for us to kind of take away as the key points about CSF um, is the absorption of CSF takes place in arachnoid granulations and back into the bloodstream. The normal total volume of cerebral spinal fluid in adults is around 150 cc's, uh, produced by choroid plexus at a rate of about 20 cc per hour or about 500 cc's per day. Hope you can see my bottles as a demonstration of the fluid. So approximately 500 milliliters is produced in a 24 hour period and the turnover of CSF is up to fourfold each day. So the subarachnoid space widens in certain spaces to form larger CSF collections that are called cisterns, which we'll talk about in just a second. That's my technological advancement. I'm gonna click here. Let's see if we can watch this beautiful cerebrospinal fluid as it gets in. And I hope you all can see this as the CSF flows, third ventricle, into the fourth, and look how beautifully it covers the brain into arachnoid granulation. All right. Nice. It works. Let's see if I'm going to hopefully not mess this up. Cisterns, yes. All right. So as the subarachnoid space widens in certain spaces to form larger CSF collections that are called cisterns. These cisterns are CSF spaces situated between the brain and skull, separated from each other by uh, trabeculated uh, porous walls of arachnoid uh, with various size openings. They typically contain uh, transversing arteries, veins, or nerves. These cisterns are bounded by septations, which may become inflamed um, and fibrotic thus limiting circulation of CSF. There is increasing research now suggesting that this pathology may contribute to some cases of communicating hydrocephalus. So CSF empties into the cistern magna via the median aperture or medial foramen of Magandhi and the lateral foramen of Lushka. not to get too stuck in cisterns, but the CSF then circulates in the subarachnoid cisterns surrounding the brainstem to reach the cerebral convexity. So ultimately the CSF may diffuse passively into the venous sinuses via the arachnoid of villi. Much of the CSF reabsorption will occur at the arachnoid uh, granulations of the dural sinuses. The cerebral convexity CSF spaces, cerebrospinal fluid spaces, are large in fetuses, and then they become progressively smaller towards childhood and adolescence. However, they enlarge again in older age, most prominently over the parietal lobes. Before we move away from the cisterns, um, I wanted just to touch base on perpendicular cistern, which is called perpendicular foss, is on the ventral surface of the midbrain between the cerebral pentacles. The prepontine cistern, which is ventral to the pons, contains the basal, uh, basal artery and the six nerves. The cisterna magna is the largest cistern and is located beneath the cerebellum and near the foramen um, magnum. And hopefully the pictures will add to this. It's 
touching a little bit on cerebrospinal fluid physiology and the kind of the information that I thought would be um, pertinent for us to know, it provides a certain degree of protection, but obviously not in any type of high impact injury. Um, it will slow movement of the brain and quick rotations of the head, but will not necessarily protect our patients against significant injury. The stabilization of the chemical balance of the CSF and allowing clearance of the waste products into the bloodstream is another um, utilization of the CSF fluid and the maintenance of buoyancy of the brain as the brain weights approximately 1.5 kilograms and the surrounding fluid reduces the net weight of the brain within the cranial cavity. So as we kind of move down a little bit, the lumbar cistern contains the cauda equina and a sac of nerve roots. These nerves that leave the spinal cord between spaces in the bones of the spine to connect to other parts of the body. At the lower end of the spinal cord, the, these nerve roots provide the ability to move and feel sensation in our legs and bladder. Um, this is where the uh, lumbar puncture or the spinal tap is done. Just to touch base a little bit on the choroid plexus before we move on, is located in the roof of the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle and the roof of the third and fourth ventricle and rests on the floor of the frontal horns of the atrius of the lateral ventricle. It's comprised of vascular pia stroma um, covered by the choroidal epithelium. One of the primary functions, not surprisingly, is produce CSF uh, via the epidermal cells that line the ventricles of the brain. So as CSF is reabsorbed at the arachnid granulations, where the arachnid villus cells mediate one-way bulk transport of CSF through the giant vacuolus large enough to engulf entire red blood cells. The CSF flows over the surface of the brain down the length of the spinal cord while in the subarachnoid space. It leaves the subarachnoid space, hopefully you can see little errors here, um, through arachnoid villi found along the superior sagittal ven uh, venous sinus. It's intracranial venous sinuses and around the roots of the spinal cord. So as the CSF protects the brain from damage, so um, is the skull and meninges. Another protective element is brain, uh, blood and brain barrier. This is a barrier between the brain's blood vessels and the cells and other components that make up brain tissue. The collective term blood and brain barrier is used to describe four main interfaces between the central nervous system and the periphery. The blood-brain barrier proper formed by tight junctions between the endothelial cells of the cerebral vasculature. The blood-brain barrier lets water, oxygen, nutrients, and fat-soluble molecules um, enter the new neural tissue, but prevents entry of the most harmful substances. So the blood-brain barrier is formed primarily by brain endothelial cells in capillaries. The endothelial cells form tight junctions, um, and substances entering or leaving the brain must travel through the endothelial cells, mostly by active transport process. These endothelial cells and the tight junctions between them form the blood-brain barrier. The blood CSF barrier is distinct from the blood and brain barrier um, and exists as part of the choroid plexus responsible for producing CSF. Uh, the capillaries of the choroid plexus are freely permeable, um, but the choroid epithelial cells form the barrier between the capillaries and the CSF. So lipid soluble substances such as O2 and CO2 um, penetrate readily across the cell membrane of the blood brain and blood CSF barriers. So the question that kind of we often ask is this is a fairly dry material, even with pictures is why knowledge of ventricles is important. Um, I'll certainly talk about NPH in just a minute, 
But a uh, few things to also keep in mind is tuberous sclerosis complex um, is variably expressed autosomally dominant um, neurocutaneous disorder affects multiple organ systems, including the skin, heart, kidney, lungs, and the brain. And the subipendymal new nodules, these are the um, hematomas that form in the walls of ventricles. Although these are usually symptomatic, some will evolve into sub, uh, sub, subpendymal giant cell astrocytomas, particularly in those with family history of TSC um, and those presenting a, before age 20. So most of us, I suspect, are clinicians here, and I did not want to end this without talking about it, uh, about NPH and um, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, it can be defined as uh, pathologic enlargement of the intracranial cerebrospinal fluid filled spaces. Um, it's now apparent and known to us as individuals with NPH may have larger heads than unaffected individuals. They might have previously unrecognized congenital hydrocephalus that becomes symptomatic um, only late in life. Now, the evidence uh, that congenital hydrocephalus is precursor to idiopathic NPH is um, only seen in subset of patients. So as the ventricles enlarge, adjacent brain tissue is displaced, and I try to put the images here, and uh, later stretched and or compressed depending on the location. Uh, the initial displacement, the elevation of the corpus callosum may be at the expense of the subarachnoid compartment, especially if there is additional brain atrophy. The venous compartment and the extracellular compartment with negligible damage to brain cells can also be seen. Initially, the uh, opposite surface of the ventricles are spread apart, but there is no change to the surface area. Beyond this threshold, when the surface area of the ventricles is forced to expand, um, that's when we can see more symptoms. And normal pressure hydrocephalus is one of the few causes of dementia that's potentially reversible. Um, NPH can occur uh, with varying combinations or degrees of each of the elements of classical triad, most familiar to all of us, such as gait disturbance, urinary incontinence, and dementia. Um, Idiopathic and pH originates from impaired CSF absorption in the absence of prior illness or injury that can cause it, such as meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, gait disturbance is typically the most prominent symptom of NPH, but cognitive impairment and urine incontinence are also common in our patients. Uh, the condition gradually progresses and is frequently seen in older adults. The symptomatic improvement can be achieved through surgical placement, placement for those um, suitable for CSF shunting. The term idiopathic adult hydrocephalus syndrome is, would be more accurate because the intracranial pressure is not always normal in, um, in patients with NPH. Um, so I, I kept here the image of a typical patient with normal pressure hydrocephalus with narrowing of the CSF spaces uh, near the vertex and widening uh, closer to the sylvian fissure, uh, which is a good indicator of NPH uh, and those who respond well to treatment. The few white sulca that's seen in the cerebral convexity, white narrow, uh, white, right here with the white arrow here, um, are all in the vicinity of large superficial arteries. So the uh, pathophysiology is a leading uh, here, is a leading theory to explain um, NPH is the poor venous compliance, uh, which has been demonstrated in a superior sagittal sinus uh, of patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus, which impairs both cerebrospinal fluid uh, pulsations and hence the flow through the aqueduct and the CSF absorption through the arachnoid uh, granulation. Just to touch base on the neurologic signs and symptoms, again, just a little bit more and in more detail, the severity of cognitive deficits appear to correlate with the presence of, super, uh, of vascular risk factors. Um, I also wanted to point out the cerebrovascular disease is comorbid in about 60% of patients with NPH. Um, and it can be challenging to assess the character of each of the symptoms, as we know, um, due to other conditions that could 
produce symptoms similar to NPH. Uh, for instance, as we know, the gait disturbance can be seen in other movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease and uh, most commonly memory cognitive uh, concern um, is heard from patients with Alzheimer's. Um, in fact, in a lot of cases, that's how NPH gets missed because the patients are considered to be um, those with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for the bladder incontinence, again, something that could be missed uh, because there's a host of urological and neurological diseases that could be suspected that cause um, urinary concerns in our older adults. Having said that, we know that these are typical presentations that go together and they need to be evaluated in, um, in conjunction with other symptoms. Um, certainly the gait is what seems to be one of the most concerning symptoms, typically described as wide bait gait um, that's slow and unsteady. Patients usually walk, patients usually walk in small steps. They have poor floor clearance. Um, you know, if I have time, I'll talk about our, uh, well, the Boone scale that we use in our clinic um, to assess for gait disturbance. Uh, but typically there's a very low feet clearing to the floor, feet, feet are getting kind of stuck to the floor. Um, otherwise described as sometimes patients feel like their feet are glued to the floor um, and referred as magnetic feet. The degree of gait disturbance is dependent on severity of NPH um, and patients who are in early stages of disease can walk almost normally, um, except maybe of some unsteadiness. Um, so it's important to kind of have a good sense of gait evaluation or assessment. It's not uncommon to actually encounter patients who are still highly functioning and just report gait disturbance um, and just feeling unsteady when they walk, uh, particularly against the incline. Um, although interestingly, my patients sometimes would say to me that they have more trouble going down the stairs than up the stairs. Um, oh, sorry, I might have had a typo. I meant NPH. Um, so uh, the most abnormal turning uh, is characteristic feature of gait abnormality with multiple steps being needed to turn in one place. Um, it's notable that many standardized gait scales, uh, there's a cutoff usually for multi-step turns. In most cases, uh, NPH patients could require up to five or six steps. Um, in some cases, uh, I've seen patients need in 10 to 12 steps. Uh, in, severe, in severe cases of NPH, they can't turn at all without someone kind of, without me holding my patient. Um, I think I'm kind of, one second. All right. Oh, so talking about incontinence, uh, this is a bladder diary that we've utilized with our patients. We would actually uh, give a patient an envelope or a family member an envelope and this bladder diary to keep with them and then mail back to us so we can get a better sense of their um, uh, bladder situations. And urinary incontinence may start as a progressive urgency, but many of our patients will have frank incontinence. Uh, by the time they come and see us for an evaluation or see a neurologist. Um, it's a symptom that we really need to be asking about. And, um, you know, I, I have a mentor who says to me always that we're first uh, psychologists and then we're neuropsychologists. So um, I say that because for older adults, it might be embarrassing for them to talk about incontinence in front of their family members. So I think we always have to play that game of, of like being careful um, and mindful of how we ask these questions. Um, they, uh, some patients may not even realize that incontinence is a symptom of something. You know, they kind of, they get used to it and see that's always having bladder issues. So asking these very detailed questions about um, whether it's urgency, whether it's leakage, whether it's because they have trouble getting to the bathroom, whether they know when they have to go, um, would be important to get more details about the type of incontinence that they have um, you can certainly ask if they wear uh, diapers, adult diapers, or if they wear the pants, or if they have pads, and you can kind of ask those questions as well. I just urge every clinician to kind of be mindful of um, how the patient may take up those questions because they're sensitive. Um, so it's not uncommon uh, for some patients to develop functional incon incontinence where gait disturbance may actually interfere with successfully going to the bathroom. Um, they kind of may brush off these symptoms. They may not even bring them up or, you know, they might say, you know, I, I have a patient who, who just said to me recently, oh, you know, I just, you know, I don't walk fast enough uh, to get to the, bath to the bathroom. Um, so it's important to be asking specific questions just as it's important to ask if it's 
urinary incontinence only, if it's bladder incontinence, which could be the bladder, the bowel, I apologize, the bowel incontinence can occur in later stages of um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So really important to kind of delve, delve into those questions um, because unlike gait or cognition, that's not something we can easily measure, which is why the bladder diary was is utilized in our clinic. Um, of course, there's a mental, you know, cognitive changes in our patients with NPH. Uh, the mental decline is usually in the form of problems with memory, particularly short-term memory. Um, it may also involve some decreases in mental alertness. Obviously, we have to make sure that our patients who are not mentally alert um, are not having symptoms of UTI. Uh, but we we see we see changes in processing speed. We see changes in attention, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But at the neuropathological level, the general effects of hydrocephalus can be understood as a subcortical disconnection syndrome because of injury of uh, to the lone pair of ventricular pathways, corpus callosum uh, projection pathways that support communication across different brain regions. So with that in mind, hydrocephalus is not strictly an injury to a white matter nor is it an isolated condition. Rather, hydrocephalus is usually secondary to another disease progression, rarely occurs um, as the only entry, um, entity affecting outcomes. Um, so it's important for us to kind of keep in mind the risk factors for NPH can, have, can be hypertension, uh, vascular disease, uh, diabetes as uh, one of the vascular risk factors. Just to kind of break down a little bit more uh, cognitive presentation, um, NPH is usually diagnosed radiologically uh, with patients presenting with headaches, urinary incontinence, uh, gait abnormalities, and mental decline. Can be confused with Parkinson's disease, so just be careful and ask all the right questions. Make sure to review the neurological report. Um, can be quite incapacitating, so that's when we come in and with our investigative questions. Um, in terms of neuropsych, we typically see diffuse pattern of performance. We see obviously motor-based impairment, which you know, in us neuropsychologists immediately brings up a question of how do we measure processing speed? How do we measure executive functioning? We have to keep in mind that motor could be impaired. Um, so the attention deficit, particularly with strong motor component, processing speed uh, deficiency. So you want to be thinking which measures would be better, um, those that have motor component and those without. Uh, when it comes to executive um, dysfunction, again, you want to reduce the motor um, component as much as possible and, and um, try to examine executive function without motor component. Um, the spatial deficits, uh, higher verbal and visual spatial performance usually seen, and then performance even out, evens out when tests are not timed or without motor component. Um, so just be sure to balance motor and non-motor tasks. Um, these patients do have retrieval deficits. Uh, we do know that improvement after shunting is more likely in patients who have not shown severe gait difficulties or have uh, evidence of dementia prior to shunting. Um, this list is obviously not exclusive. I was debating whether I should put some measures that we utilize in our neuropsych assessments. Um, so happy to have a discussion about this. Uh, but I put a list of measures that we um, try to utilize. Uh, Petra Klinger um, and a few others and I have uh, looked at uh, line tracing and serial dotting, um, which is a test that kind of has a motor component, has been used for pre, um, pre spinal tap, post spinal tap, um, and post shunting. So I just put a picture up if anyone's interested, but it's a, it's a, a line tracing and we also have serial dotting that we've utilized as well and published on it. Um, just a little bit to touch on uh, the psychiatric aspects in patients with NPH. It can't be ignored um, that our patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus do suffer from psychiatric symptoms. Uh, about 73% actually have uh, symptoms um, such as apathy and about 25% of patients have anxiety. Um, they can't be ignored. We need to assess for them. We need to monitor these patients. Uh, particularly if they are um, pre-shunt candidates. Uh, we need to ensure that we know about these symptoms and help patients manage them. Um, the studies have shown that uh, these disorders, um, that I apologize, that neuropsychiatric symptoms can increase after surgery, particularly in patients with pre-existing neuropsychiatric changes. Um, and we also know that some patients develop 
increased neuropsychiatric symptoms that they didn't have post-surgery. Um, so we have to be kind of careful how we manage those symptoms um, and just to get a little bit on the soapbox when it comes to, you know, we're not psychiatrists, but when it comes to medication management, antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, and um, ECT, again, have consultation, talk to a psychiatrist, a neurologist before uh, making these decisions about kind of medication use or our recommendations should be geared towards careful medication monitoring. I'm putting in um, questionnaires that we like to use, uh, happy again to discuss, but I cannot emphasize strongly that when you have a patient coming in with NPH or any other condition, interview, interview, interview. Um, we're, we're good interviewers, so we could get a lot of information from the patient and family members. Um, and obviously don't ignore family members. So you've evaluated the patient. Um, you can tell that they have NPH. And just to kind of touch base a little bit on the CSF uh, removal, a lumbar puncture uh, or a spinal tap is routinely done to obtain uh, supraspinal fluid for lab results. Um, its role is different in NPH. It's not so much the CSF sampling, although you know in most cases, um, uh, in particular at Butler Hospital, we would send out samples for, um, for testing, but rather, what we are looking at is CSF evacuation to see whether the removal of CSF from a patient's system results in improvement of symptoms, particularly gait. So you're looking for improvement in gait, and it's usually uh, it's 40 mils that are taken out. And for more accurate comparison, uh, we, uh, we videotape our patients uh, pre and post LP um, and patients who show response, and then we double code it. But patients who show response um, usually uh, return uh, to the pre-lumbar pre puncture gait disturbance after a few weeks. So this is not a long-standing um, improvement in our patients um, in gait, but it further solidifies the diagnosis of um, NPH in our patients. You've had a patient tested, you've done the CSF, well, the, you know, me between the neurologist has done the CSF removal, uh, which could be done in and out of the hospital, in or out of the hospital. Um, in terms of the ventral, uh, uh, vent I'm sorry, the shunt uh, system, ventricular peritoneal shunt system placement, um, the shunting procedure involves inserting the proximal catheter into the lateral ventricles and connecting it to the reservoir vault unit. Um, I'm sure there's some awesome videos, but I find this picture super helpful and simple. Um, this unit in turn is then connected to the distal catheter, which drains into a peritoneal cavity where the CSF is absorbed along its lining. Um, I've had this patient ask uh, my students, so some wonder if, uh, whether this will cause the abdomen to bloat, but in the reality, unless the peritoneum uh, has some malabsorption problem, patients will not notice any change because of the CSF amount that's coming out of the distal tip is actually um, just a trickle and not an outpour of a CSF. Uh, the ventricular catheter is placed through the occipital or frontal burr hole, and the uh, rest of the shunting system is threaded down to the side of the neck and anterior chest wall um, into subglial uh, subcutaneous layer um, with the aid of the tunneling device. Patient is left with two just small incisions on the top of the scalp um, and another one in abdominal wall. The, um, usually the operation is done under general anesthesia. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes. Obviously, you know, this is all depends on a neurosurgeon. Um, and commonly, my patients would stay overnight for one night unless there's some kind of complications. Um, in most cases, in adults with normal pressure hydrocephalus, treatment is essential um, and may restore motor and mental functions. Um, in some cases, patients that we've seen shunt uh, revisions uh, could be necessary. Uh, and obviously, you know, there are certain considerations that are made um, when deciding whether shunt revisions would be done or not. And neurosurgeons are usually involved in that process as well as neurologists. Um, so what happens after uh, post-shunt placement? Several studies have demonstrated cognitive and neuropsychological changes after the surgery. Um, these findings suggest that shunt surgery is most sensitive for improving overall global functioning. Um, not surprising, something probably I would love to change, but MMSC is often used and there's an overall global score improvement in monumental status exam. Um, on our testing, we see uh, improvement in fluency, improvement in attention, psychomotor speed, executive functioning, learning and memory is improved. Um, we also see executive functioning improvements. 
Um, and some studies, obviously not surprising, show that cognitive impairment before the surgery is associated with um, neurocognitive decline post shunt, which is why, which is where we come in to kind of make sure we assess our patients carefully. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, I think I'm about to be ready for questions. I really wanted to put this slide in. So I think it's nice um, overview. How am I doing on time? You're doing great. Okay, I have a few more slides ready just in case, but if I'm... Oh, you're fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I can keep going a little bit more? Yes. Nice. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to, uh, this is the NPH gate scale that uh, we use um, in our clinic uh, to evaluate patients and we videotape our patients. Um, so I wanted to show you, and this is, you know, ability to walk. We make a note baseline post shunt, uh, post tap or a post shunt, and we take care of the gait. Uh, we look at their gait, we monitor their steps um, and so on. And then we uh, double score uh, for publications um, when that is done. 